Amen. Boy, give the Lord one more big old hand clap of praise. Have a great time of worship. Amen. How many is ready for baptism Sunday next week? Don't you know it's going to be an awesome time? Boy, we're just going to hoop and holler and just, you know, just, just act up. Y'all can, y'all got permission next week. Just act up, whatever that. <laughs> Might regret that, but I just said it anyway. Um. I just want to talk about, you know, in, in baptism, one of the words that came, came to my spirit this minute was, was, was a risk taker. And I want to talk a little bit about, about risk taking. Risk taking is attached to faith and just, and just take, taking God at his word and taking God, um, it, it literally, um, the faith that, uh, that, that we have in him and, and what he can do. Uh, a Christian baptism is a dedication to follow, follow the Lord and, and, and become his disciple. And so, obviously I'm ta- talking to two different types of people, or, or same people, but two different times because I got some people that are, had already made a decision or, and going to make a decision about being baptized next week, and I'm going to tell you the reason why you made a decision. And a lot of us in here, rest of us, have already been baptized. And uh, Matthew 28, verse 19. And in Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we, we become disciples of Christ. To be disciples of Christ means we're followers of Christ. And, and one of the ways that we identify as followers of Christ is we get baptized. We don't be baptized to be saved. We're baptized because we are saved. And, and we just, it's just a... It's just a dramatization of, of what's already happened to us. And it's a, uh, it is, it is an, an honor that God just honors with his grace and his mercy whenever we obey him. And that's why it's always a very, a very important time um, for us and most churches who participate in, in baptism. To be baptized, you must do something practical. You got to humble yourself. I mean, you got to humble yourself before the Lord. Well, that's how you got saved anyway. You humbled yourself before the Lord. You realize, you know, I'm not as haughty, haughty as I thought I thought I was, and is, and sometimes he'll put you to that place, and you become you become humble. I believe there's no there's no uh, better way to, to signify your humility before before the Lord um, is is the Bible actually says, "Blessed is the humble, um, those who who humble him, for for we shall see God." And so it is. It is the humble because we just humble ourselves before the Lord. And, and you make a covenant with God to submit yourself, to obey the, the Spirit of God, even to the point of death. And you say, well, wait a minute, I don't, I don't know if I want to take a bullet or something like a sword or, or whatever. Well, well, hopefully on, on this side of heaven, that, that doesn't happen because of your faith. But he's not talking about that alone. He's talking about dying to the deeds and the lusts of the flesh. How I many sometimes we need to humble ourselves to die to the deeds of the flesh? to die to what flesh has. I think sometimes the devil, I, I, I have some weeks, the devil can take a couple of days off because my flesh makes enough, I come up enough mess because of my own flesh. I mean, you know, don't need you today, devil. I, I'm, I'm making a mess of this all by myself. And sometimes that does happen, but we want to die to the deeds of the lust of the flesh and all that is old and let the past be buried. Everybody knows that, that whenever you become born again, the past is buried. Amen. It's starting to the sea of forgetfulness. I mean, it, it's one thing, one thing with God, if I was teaching on forgiveness today, uh, with us, we'll say, I forgive you, but I won't forget it. How many is thankful that God doesn't operate that way? He didn't say, if I, I'll forgive you, but I don't forget it. He says, when I forgive you, I forget it. Oh, hallelujah. That's a good shouting place right there. I forget it. What sin? I've, I've done a buried it. It's gone. It's dead. It's dead to me. God says your sin is dead to me. And when you get into the, to the baptismal waters, that it is, it's a dramatization. Again, not to be born again, not to die to yourself. You're doing it because you are. And you're making a public declaration of what God has done for you and, and, and you're dying to your old self. That let, let the past be buried. And the good thing is we rise up the righteousness. What does that mean? We rise up, what is righteousness? Right standing with God. 
Does that mean you're perfect? That mean you got everything figured out? No. But now when God looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ is on you. He sees the faith that you have in, in you. And even though you cannot fulfill one law, Jesus fulfilled every single law. And when he sees you, he sees Jesus. And he don't have a problem with you because he don't have a problem with Jesus. And he puts you in right standing with him. All because you have faith in what Jesus has done. Amen? Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. That's good stuff. But see, this all doesn't happen through our old life, but in a new life given in God. How many know we got a new life? Old things are passed away. What's that? That's just a nice way of saying old things become dead. All things are dead. I mean, it's all this, all you Halloweeners, you know, celebrating all this dead stuff. I'm not about dead stuff. But the one thing I do know about dead stuff is that dead people can't bother me. If it's dead, it can't hurt me. Come on, right? I mean, it can't hurt me. It's dead. It's dead. And that's what happens to the old person. That's what happens to the old self is that you're dead. That means it's, it, it can't hurt you anymore. How, what happens with that? At salvation, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes into life, you die, you humble yourself to the old person. And that is the dramatization that takes place in this baptismal pool here that we're down with the old, we're buried with it, but we're raised back up to the newness of life. Amen. And we celebrate. We celebrate that new life. We celebrate what Christ has done for us. Baptism in the day of Jesus, which we, we read the scripture in Matthew 28, understood as a right of invitation into something new. When people was being baptized, when John was being baptized, and all through all through the Bible, when people was baptized, it's a it's an invitation. It is it is a, a realization or initiation, actually. It's an initiation into something new. Whenever people get next week, we're going to celebrate the newness of, it doesn't matter what things has been, what matters now is there's a newness in life. Have you know that God is, God is, God is not a, um, he's not a remodeler. Ain't nothing wrong with remodeling anything, but, but I mean, he don't take us and remodel us. He takes us and make us brand new. Amen. Matter of fact, the Bible says in Corinthians, he says, you become a new creation. A new creation. We think sometimes a new creation is like a remodeled bathroom or a remodeled kitchen or a remodeled house. That word creation in Greek there means something that's never existed before. Can I preach that for a second? I said something that's never existed. See, you can remodel something, put some paint on it, put some new moldings on it, put some new caulking in it, but the devil still recognizes the old, that the new is over the old. But when you become a new creation, the devil don't even recognize you because you're a new creation and something like you has never existed before. The pushover you used to be, the one that couldn't, couldn't make it all the way through is gone and the new person has raised up to the newness of life. You are a new creation this morning. Amen? And I'm speaking to those who are celebrating baptism next week, but I'm speaking to those who are not because you have been. I want you to remember that that's who you are. You've been raised to life. You are, and when Jesus, when God looks down at you, he don't see you, but he sees Jesus and everything that he has fulfilled in you. And you're not a remodeled version of what God has done. You are a brand new creation. Come on, how many believe that this morning? You got to remind yourself that kind of stuff. I told you last week, you got to talk to yourself sometimes. And that's what baptism does. To be baptized is a sign of adherence to the teaching of the respected teacher. Maybe he knows that Jesus is the word. This is the canning. This is the, this is the infallible words of God. This is not a dictation. This isn't God sitting down with the Holy Spirit or, or sitting down with man and it's God through the Holy Spirit sitting down with, with man but this is, and, and saying dictate. Sometimes uh, I sit down with one of my assistants. I'll say, send this out or, or, or send this text or send this email and I tell them what I want. They go back and they write it down on how they interpret it. They get it pretty close and they get it in there good enough. This is, this, this, is not, this, this, this is not that. This right here is a dictation. This is every word that precedes out of the mouth of God and whenever we are baptized we're saying that we adhere to the teachings of this word everything it says we believe it 
We don't believe this is a suggestion. We believe it is a commandment. And he is not only king, but he is Lord. And we say, yes, Lord. To it. it doesn't matter what a political party says. It doesn't matter what your friend says. It doesn't matter how many likes you get on social media because you, 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 you like the other stuff. We Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Here, my friend, is the mouth of God. Amen. And we're living a time right now, just kind of stop here. I don't know what's going to happen to America. Because America is trying to figure out what teachings do we come underneath. Is it the teaching of man? You know, the Bible said there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is destruction. And then there's another half that says, no, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord and him only shall we serve. And there's a line being drawn right now between good and evil, right and wrong, and, and living for God and living for the world. If you live for the world, you're living for the devil. And so I sit here, I get asked a question all the time, especially it's election year and all kinds of things happening. But preacher, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to America? I don't know what's going to happen to America. Matter of fact, I've studied eschatology since the 80s. One of the first things I grabbed hold of whenever I realized that, boy, you know, you can learn some stuff about the Bible. You can study some stuff about the Bible. And one of the things that intrigued me even in the late 80s was, was, was eschatology, was the teaching of the end times and the prophecy and what the Bible says. There's, there's so much that the Bible says about end times, and, and we're living in it right now. I mean, this is it. The next great event to take place prophetically in the word of God is the rapture of the church. Oh, hallelujah. You say, well, I don't believe in that. Well, if you believe in Jesus and whether you believe it or not, if the trumpet toots, you're going to scoop. We're all getting up out of here. Amen. How many is ready? <laughs> I'm not waiting for the third or fourth bus load. I'm going the first when it comes by, man. You get out of the way. I'm coming. I move, move, move. I'm sitting there. Move. What's going to happen to America? I don't know. We're still trying to figure it out. We say we're one nation under one God, but God is exposing some things right now. One thing that we understand is Christianity is a, is, is, is a, is, is a root of, of Judaism. Mm, got quiet in this Presbyterian church. That's okay. I'll, I'll teach it. They believe in God. just don't believe in Jesus being the Messiah. We believe in the same God. We just believe that Messiah is not coming. He's already come, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus says, and, and the Bible says, blessed is the nation who stands with Israel. And God, is, and God has exposed, I believe some things are being, being exposed. Uh, uh, when, when Sinwar, the, the mastermind, the Hamas mastermind that was killed this week in Rafa, after our government told Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, don't go into Rafa. Don't, don't go door to door. Don't deal with that. But they did it anyway. And because of that, it knocked on the door. And there was the mastermind. That, was, that is equivalent to our bin Laden, 2001 people. And he is no more. Hey, you know, sometimes you just got to listen to God and what God says. We also told them don't bring in, don't bring in, don't, don't, don't he told Israel, pull out of Gaza until you bring more aid in there. Well, they found out they're bringing aid in there and Hamas is still in truckloads of aids to benefit them. That's feeding your own enemy. That was exposed. Sometimes God will expose things so we know which way we need to go. I heard just a couple of nights ago at a rally, in the Harris campaign rally, This is, in which this is not it, I'm just telling you. <laughs> being being pro-abortion as the whole rally was about, and someone stand up because they're talking about that subject and stands up and says, Jesus is Lord. Yeah. <laughs> to which she says, you're in the wrong rally. You need to go to the other rally. I'm here to tell our church, make sure you're at the right rally. Preacher, 
I'll tell you what I told the first service. You can't say that too late. I just did. I've already said it. You better make sure you're choosing this day who you're going to serve. I'm not here. I'm not picking a name, but I am taking a belief system. And I'm not telling you this is perfect and that guy's perfect and she's not and he is and all this kind of stuff. I'm here to tell you if they're going to bring up the name of the Lord and say, we don't march under that. He is Jehovah Nissi. And you better make sure you're marching under that banner, under that standard. Why? Because we don't know what's going to happen to America. Is it that simple? It can't be that simple. It is. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. How many believe that today? I'm just under the, I'm just under the understanding that, that that's who we are. And God is exposing some things. Whenever a person gets into that baptismal tank, baptismal tank, tank they are exposing some things. What are we exposing? We're exposing that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of Lord of our lives. And things begin to change. Baptism are for those who have now come to the place where they have repented their sins and they believe with all their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Acts chapter number 8, verse 36. In Acts chapter 8, verse 36, the Bible says to Philip, when they went down to the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Boy, isn't that the question? What hinders me, Pastor, from being baptized? And then the Bible says, Philip says, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And the eunuch answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Oh, hallelujah. Verse 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and was baptized. Let me tell somebody here today, if you believe that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of Lord of your heart, it will behoove you to jump into the water. It will behoove you to make sure you tell everybody, including yourself, that I believe. And if you don't know if you should or not, I'm here to tell you that if you believe that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord, and you believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord I invite you next week to come here and be baptized to lectures to not not to be made that decision but because you have made that decision and the most important I want to tell the rest of this church if you have been baptized don't forget that you have been baptized under a name to which you believe not half heartedly but you believe wholeheartedly that there's no way into heaven whereby men should be saved except for the name of Jesus Christ Christ and him only and there's no name which man should be saved except for the name of Jesus if you believe it give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning I believe God is stirring up some stuff I believe it baptism is not for those who are half hearted to believe with all your heart implies sincerity we are sincere about this if they're sincere that Jesus is Lord's being said, you're in the wrong rally. I'm here to tell you, you didn't have to tell me that because I'm only in the one rally that declares that Jesus Christ is Lord and him only is he king of lords. <laughs> to be baptized doesn't mean you're doing it to, in sincerity, it doesn't mean you're doing it to please a preacher or your social media status or a family member or even self. God only wants to baptize those who have sincere trust that Jesus Christ is our Savior. Hallelujah. And he is my Lord. Amen. We needed a Savior and Jesus came and he saved us. Saved us from what? From all the destruction that the enemy wished to come upon us. And because of that, he is our Lord. He only wants to baptize those who really wants to die to this world, to die to flesh, to have power over the enemy, and to live for God. Isn't that just, isn't that four, boy, you want some points? There you are right there. You know what, God? I, I, I want to die to this world. I want to die to my flesh. I want to have power over the devil. And I'll be honest with you, I just want to live for you, Lord. Will you help me? He said, yes, I will. It's called grace. And my grace gives you the ability to do what I've called you to do. That's what baptism is for. 
That's for everyone who signed up. That's for those who are coming. That's why we baptize, is to make a public de declaration, not, not just to be seen, not for ourselves, not for the preacher, not for social status. It's because we believe sincerely with all our heart that we just want to live for God. Amen. And I can't do it without you, Holy Spirit, but with you I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And he reminds us, he tells us, I want to suggest that every Christian's life is marked by windows of opportunity that demand a radical step of faith. Has, have you ever experienced anything like that? I'm not talking about before you got saved. I say since you've been saved. I think whenever, as soon as you get saved, the first, radical, the first radical opportunity you have of a step of faith is baptism. And God will allow a winner of opportunity that demands a radical step of faith in order to follow Jesus Christ. But the main thing is fulfill his purpose for their life. I don't want you today just following Christ. I want you to fulfill the purpose for your life that he has for you. And you will always find opportunities of, of radical steps of faith that says this doesn't make any sense. I don't know if I can do it or not. And you question whether or not you can do it. I'm here to tell you, don't question whether, what's going to happen if God doesn't do it. Only question whether or not what's going to happen if God does do it. And if God's do it, your entire life is going to change forever. Amen. The difference between being good and great is not a matter of knowledge or pedigree, but a willingness to take radical steps of faith. Amen. I don't know about you. I don't just want to be a good Christian. I want to be a great Christian. Amen. I tell my staff all the time, we don't want to be a good church. We want to be a great church. Come on. We don't want to just be good servants of God. We want to be great. I'll be, let me go ahead and tell you. I'm going to let you know on a secret. I want to be, I'm after being God's favorite. Uh, somebody's got to be. Somebody's got to be. Who say, "How oh, you're 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 just a teacher's pet." Well, that's okay. That's what we're after. Amen. Not just to be good, and there's nothing wrong with good, but not when great is laying over there. Amen. I don't want a good blessing. I want a great blessing. Come on. I just, I want everything that God has to offer. And that's what, that's what the Bible tells us. And, and how do we get that? The willingness to take a radical step of faith. Do something. Everybody says, that's crazy. Can't believe you're going to do that. What makes a step of faith radical is that it always involves a significant risk. Might cost you something. Take these off so I can see you real good. Might cost you some stuff. Might cost you some so-called friends. Might cost you some social status. Might cost you your reputation. It's hanging on by a thread anyway. <laughs> I'm here to tell you today, I have state the I have I have place the reputation of my name the name of my wife the name of my children my children's children upon this church upon everybody that attends this church that we are willing to take a radical step of faith if God says step out and do it then bless God you better get our way because we're getting ready to step out and do it so I believe God wants to do something great what makes a, a, a faith radical is that it always involves a significant risk and in every aspect of our relationship with the Lord he will bring you to the edge of a decision you know everything about baptism is about a decision a decision is made the fact, let's back it up some more the fact that you got saved and born again is attached to a decision the fact that you sit under a teaching or a preaching or read a word that led you to Christ was a decision. God doesn't force feed you. You're not saved because you are spiritually waterboarded. You are saved in a new life and on your way to heaven today because you made a decision. Hallelujah. You've gone from death to life, from heading to hell to heading to heaven, from being eternally separated from God to being in eternal life with God. And every bit of that is attached to a decision. And I'm dared to say here today that it was, and it will always goes down as the greatest and most radical decision that you've ever made. 
no, 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 no. I'm going to say that again. The fact that day you got saved and the decision you made to make Jesus Christ King of Kings and Lord of your life is and will always go down as the most defining, radical, faithful decision that you've ever made in your life because not only did it change you, but it changed everything attached to you. No, no, man, you know, I went to church that one time and met the pastor. Felt the same. Oh, no, I'm not talk politics now, I'm on this. Well, I question whether or not you got saved. <laughs> what? He can't do that. I don't know to say, you are not. If it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. Oh, he's on ducks again. <sighs> walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, looks like a duck. Chance is pretty good. It's a, it's a duck. But I believe with all my heart that the greatest, most radical decision that you've ever made is when you said, yes, Lord. Because when you said yes, Lord, you say no to everything else. And things begin to change. It's a decision. And when you make that decision, at which point you'll have to decide whether to leap in that direction he's calling you into or pull back into a place that seems safe. The day we got saved, I got to say, yeah, I guess it's getting a little too, too sweaty for me. It's a lot of decisions. It's going to change everything. It's going to change the way I have to walk and live my life. It's going to change not only what comes out of me, it's going to change what I allow to come inside of me. It's going to change what I allow in my home, what I allow my children to watch and operate in, where I allow myself to be seen and what I, how, I, how I allow myself to react and respond. This is a radical decision. It's going to change, or I can stay exactly the way I want to and play it safe. I'm here to tell you, you're going to miss out on the best that God has for you. <laughs> Hebrews 11 and 6, God motivates us with a truth that tells us without faith it's impossible to please him. That's a, boy, that's, we, we read it, we know it, but that, that is a motivational scripture. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. That means with faith, we can please him. And honey, if you please God, he's a giver. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. We got to come to him and believe that he is and believe that he is a rewarder to those who diligently seek after him. He's a what? He's a rewarder. That's not something he does. That's who he is. He's a rewarder. And when our radical faith begins to show and move into faith, because where there is no risk, let me help y'all, there's no faith. Everything in faith is based on a risk. Just based on a risk. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I believe it. The risk is the possibility of something happening. If you risk, if you do something, it's a risk, that means it's a risk because attached to the fact that something's going to happen. If you're not risking anything, if something's not going to change, it's not a risk, it's a fact. This is a risk. It involves sometimes uncertainty about the effects or the implications of something we value. Where there is no risk, there is no faith. But where there is faith, where there is no faith, there is no power, there is no joy, there is no intimacy with God. But wherever there is faith, there is power, there is joy, and there is intimacy with God. It all starts sometimes just taking the risk. You know what? I'm just going to trust God and see what happens. What hap what, it said, what, what happens if nothing, if he does nothing? Okay, but what if he does something? What if I step out on faith and nothing happens? Well, then you didn't lose anything, did you? But what if I step out on faith and everything changes? Then it goes from good to great. 
and get ready for God to do something powerful. Risk takers follow God's voice. You know why? Because they obey God's voice. The whole thing about obedience is connected to trust and respect. Obedience comes from the Latin word literally means to hear. If you didn't hear it and you didn't do it, that's not disobedient. But if you hear it, you know, sometimes my wife thinks I got selective hearing. Well, maybe I don't think I heard that. Sometimes we do the same thing with God. We select to hear him. But obedience means, literally comes from the word to hear. When we obey God, it's a sign that we trust him and we are listening to what he is saying. When we are obeying God, we are literally saying, I hear you, Lord, and I am listening to what you are saying, right? I obey you. I'm doing it. Why? Because I heard something and I'm listening to it. And if I heard it and I'm listening to it and I do it, then the, the biggest gratification of trust and reverence I give to him is, is all in obedience is, is wrapped up in this. I believe he knows best. Let me remind you this morning that God knows best. He knows best. And every time we're obedient, we're saying, God, we realize you know our best. Abram, we give you a couple of examples here, we'll be done. Abram, he lived in a place called Ur. And he was in Ur, and, and God came to Abram, and he was faced with a choice between the status quo and doing what God says. Now, the status quo means the current state of things. And the, and the Latin word for status quo literally means the existing state or the way things are. I mean, sometimes God will come to you to change the way things are. So, I, I would go to say that Abram at this time liked the way things were. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Abraham, Abram was, was struggling. He had a wife, he had plenty of money. I mean, everything was great when he left. They were rich when they left. Things came out, things was doing good. But I want you to know that every time God comes to you to change your status quo, is it, uh, when things are going bad, it's like, didn't think you ever get here, God. But sometimes when things are going good, we have to still, when God says do it, it doesn't matter what state of existence we're in, we have to obey and do what God says. And Abram did that. Here's the whole thing about this whole thing is that, that, that suddenly he left his home, his extended family, and everything that went to follow this invisible God where God didn't say. Go back and read it. God didn't say where they were going, but they had to leave first, and then their destination would be shown later. Have you know sometimes you got to obey God first, and then the destination is going to be shown later? No, God, I ain't going nowhere until you tell me where I'm going. God says, I ain't doing nothing. They don't really talk like that. This is me. Until you obey me. And then you obey. You make a radical decision. Abram made a radical decision and stepped out on faith. Where is he going? I don't know. But guess what? I don't have to know. The God who could not be seen spoke an open end command, and Abraham, his wife, packed up all their possessions and set off. We want God to tell us what is the answer to our obedience, and God says, You can't handle the answer to your obedience. Come on, church. Abraham showed later on in life that when God tells him, I'll make you a great nation, I just need you to wait on me. Abraham doesn't approve, he can't wait on him. We have to understand by faith, it's a radical faith. God, I believe you're the invisible God, but I believe, Lord, that you have an open end command to my, to my promise. And if I just step out with a radical faith and believe that you can do all things, that I have no idea where I'm going and what I'm going to do, but I know when I get there, it's going to be better. My mind, can, it's going to be exceedingly abundantly above all I can ask or think because great is that power which is at work on the inside of me, God. I believe with all my heart. I got radical faith today. I'm a, I'm a risk taker, God. God. Abram was a risk taker and God took him to a land of Canaan how about David David showed up in front of a giant showed up in front of a giant 
with a rag and a rock. They call it a slingshot. I want to offer to you this morning that he was there with an entire Israeli powerful army. The same one we're just talking about. There's no way possible, even though I'm not saying David wasn't skillful, because the Bible says he was skillful with the with the with the with the with the slingshot. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that he was the best shot. I mean, if this was a sniper division, and this was our biggest enemy here, that affords the greatest threat, they're not going to just bring any guy up there. They want the best shot. Because you got one shot at him. And here comes David. He want the best shot. But he was the only shot. Well, you know why? Because he was the only one, that whole group, that was willing to take a risk. To do something radical. And because he stepped out on faith and he took a risk, I'm sure he thought maybe a half a second, what if I miss? But I believe towering over that was, what if I don't? New Testament Peter walking on his boat fishing Jesus walks by hey Peter you like fishing yeah come with me leave all this I'll make you fishers of men that's radical that's a risk that he's willing to take. Stepped off the boat and followed Jesus. Out of all the hundreds of fishermen that was out there that day, we're talking about one. The one whose life was changed because by faith he become a risk taker. Jarius! Jarius, you son of God ruler! You religious man, very learned man. You know the scriptures well. And the scriptures does not say that this Messiah walking around opening blinded eyes and healing lepers, there's nothing to this. I don't, I don't want you to know, but then something happened with Jairus one day. His daughter became sick, even to the point of death. He's walking around his church. Everything about his title, Son of God Ruler, points to the fact that Jesus is not the Messiah. The Messiah has not yet come. The Messiah is King. And he risked everything. His status, his reputation, his job to walk up to Jesus and say, will you just say the word? Will you come to my house? And pray for my little girl. He took a risk. And because he did, his daughter was raised to life. Interrupted in that journey comes this woman who had an issue of blood. She spent everything that she has on all the doctors she could get to. But only grew worse. She had an issue of blood that flow which meant she was unclean she's not even supposed to be seen in public let alone touch anybody the sentence for her to even be seen in public is instantaneous death by stoning you know what she did when she heard that Jesus was walking down that dusty road she became a risk taker by faith she thought I'm at, a, I'm at a decision point right now that if I reach out and I take a risk, what happens if I don't touch him? Then I'm going to die. But what happens if I do touch him? Then I might be made whole. And that woman, come on, we know the story. And that woman that day risked everything she had. She pushed through the crowd. And when Jesus came by, she reached out and she touched the hem of the garment. And the Bible says that very hour, that very moment, that very second, that very hour of the day, 
day she became whole. But that's not the greatest thing that happened to her. The greatest thing, even though she was completely healed, the greatest thing that happened to her is that Jesus turned around and he called her daughter. I'm here to tell you, if you just take a risk, my God, if you just take a risk, you will go from having nothing to being somebody in the kingdom of Almighty God. Don't hold back. Don't sit on a status quo. Don't be comfortable where you are. Believe if you have faith in God that an open end commandment is getting ready to happen in your life. Do you believe it this morning? Come on, stand to your feet. Let's go praise the Lord. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand up of praise this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. In every instance of everything I just told you, everybody's life was radically changed. Amen. Right? I could keep on and on. Keep going on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Blind Bartimaeus. Just sit down and shut up, blind man. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the invisible man right there. <laughs> oh, blind Bart. But he heard. You know, you can't see. I don't know. Thank God. But they say that people, do, if they can't see, their hearing becomes even more clear. And this is a man that learned to live his life on hearing because he can't see. And he heard that there's a man coming. It says in Isaiah, maybe he was listening in Isaiah. It says, when Messiah comes, the Spirit of the Lord will be upon him. To heal the brokenhearted, set the captives free, the recovery of sight to the blind. Isaiah sees the one. Maybe he heard that. But he's not supposed to. He's supposed to wait till somebody comes, hands him something, gives him a dollar, puts something in his little cup. He's got a decision to make. Do I make a radical risk decision and cry out if by perchance he were heal me and the Bible says old, old blind Bart began to cry out with all he had Jesus son of David have mercy on me he got louder so you got to watch risk takers. The more they told him to be quiet and shut up, the more he screamed. You want to know why? Because risk takers have already made a decision. We're going to risk all. <sighs> because they've already convinced. I got more to gain than I have to lose. Watch out people who don't want to lose anything. That's not Christianity. Christianity says, I'm willing to lose my life that I might gain it all. For the life I have with you will be greater than anything in this world has to offer. Can I finish your story? We gotta go. Here's, here's the story. Remember he had a coat? Go home and read it. I don't know where it's at. It's in the Bible. It's in the, it's got a coat. You go home, you read it. He, he screamed, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus came over and healed him. But my favorite part, the Bible says he had on a garment. And when he stood up, he took off the garment. That don't mean nothing to you unless you came to church today. See, blind people, just like anybody with a disability, had to wear a certain garment. That way, everybody knew he was passed out. Oh, you can't hear. Here you go. Oh, you can't say. Here you go. Oh, you got. Here you go. See, nobody knew. Yeah, he, he, he's officially needy. You can officially support him. This joker, after risking everything and screaming the name of Jesus, the Bible said he stood up 
And Jimmy, he took off the garment. Then started walking to Jesus. What does that mean? I'm risking everything. Come on, church. I'm risking everything. When I get done with my encounter with Jesus, I'm not going to need that bucket. I'm not going to need that corner. I'm not going to need that garment because he's getting ready to touch my eyes and make me whole. Honey, that's radical faith. That's risking everything to receive more than you ever can believe. Come on, if you believe we serve that kind of God, give God a big old hand clap of praise this morning. to be able to be a risk taker today. Amen. Come on, turn your palms up right now. Let me pray over you. Oh, hallelujah. Father, I thank you. This is a room full of risk takers. That God, every single one of us in here today, God, has risked everything. Our life, God, our, who we are, our reputation, Lord. That God, our risk is worth it because our risk is attached to our faith in you. And we believe, Lord God, with all our hearts that God, we are standing at the threshold of blessings, God, that our eyes have not seen, our ears have not heard, or either enter into the hearts of men the things that you have in store for us. But God, I thank you today. And God, we receive the best that you have. God, we're going from good to great, God, because of our radical faith. We'll believe in you, God, for open end commandments, Lord. That God, when we believe you, God, you get ready to open a door. We get ready to step into a promise of God that we never, ever knew that we could receive. Come on, we got people in here that needs to be saved. Come on, let's always say this prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, I'm making a radical decision today. Making a radical decision. I'm leaving my old self. Leaving my old self. I'm leaving my old person. My old person. I'm confessing right now. I'm confessing right now that I am a sinner. I am a sinner. And I have committed sins. I have committed sins. But today, Lord, today, Lord, I'm making the most radical decision in my life come into my life change me make me a new person fill me full of your Holy Spirit and I promise you with your grace and by your mercy I will live for you all the days of my life as you show me how in Jesus name Amen. Come on, let's give a hand clap of praise for all those who said that today. Amen.